I'm Shane Nutt. I work at Kong on Kubernetes Networking. I'm a uh, chair of SIG Network and a maintainer of Gateway API. I'm Surya, and I'm an engineer working on the Red Hat OpenShift networking team. I mostly work on SIGNET policy API working group, and together with Shane and Antonio, we're going to give the SIG network intro and updates. So welcome all, and let's get started with our agenda today. So we'll first look at the APIs that the networking team gives in Kubernetes that we're responsible for, more or less, the services, endpoint slices, gateway API, network policy API, admin network policy API, and also what's new in the 127 release, right? So that's some of the things that we'll look at. And over to Shane, we'll talk about the gateway bits. Oh, I thought you were... Yeah. Oh. So first, we'll talk about service. This is commonly one of the first APIs somebody will run into, like when they set up a deployment. You might first have got, gotten a service for your deployment when you ran kubectl expose. It enables grouping pods together and exposing them as a networking service. Um, they're given an IP address they can be reached on, and requests can be routed to one of the associated endpoints. Endpoints track IPs and ports for pods. Um, we used to have, I still have, endpoints. Uh, which had some limitations. Uh, you could only get up to 1,000 pods per service. And more recently have endpoint slices, which uh, is its, its successor. Um, it shards the endpoints, and it's much more scalable. Endpoint slices also allowed us to do things in dual stack, topology, and terminating endpoints. Next, and building on top of that, we have the ingress API, which is very common. Most people are aware of it. It's been uh, around for five plus years. It does basic host and path matching, um, TLS configuration, and it is simply and broadly implemented. There's 20 plus implementations of Ingress. You can kind of find it everywhere. Um, there are some limitations with Ingress that we ran into in the last few years. Uh, there's many non-portable extensions. What we ended up with was kind of this annotations wild west where Basically, for everything that a, an ingress controller or something would want to do, you'd end up with a custom annotation for it, and it just kind of kept going until you, the situation we have today is no two ingresses do anything remotely similar to each other. Um, it had an insufficient permission, per, permission model, and it mainly focused on HTTP traffic. Also, and we'll get to this in a couple slides here, it was limited to north and south traffic, which led us into the Gateway API. So Gateway API is the next generation on top of this, rather, uh, as an alternative, and handles routing and load balancing um, in a similar way, but with may, way many more features than what Ingress provided. It's uh, expressive, extensible. It's role-oriented. So as you can see over here, we have like Gateway class, Gateway, HTTP route. HTTP route is like the closest thing you have to Ingress. Gateway class is kind of similar to ingress class, if you're familiar with it. But like an admin might create a gateway, but a developer might create an HTTP route. We'll talk a little bit more about that, too. There are t beyond 20 implementations and a few integrations with it today, um, despite it still being in beta. So it's very popular, and there's a lot of people implementing it for their uh, solutions. Um, we graduated to beta last year, and our intention, we'll see how it goes, is to try to GA before Chicago this year. Um, to give a little bit more view as to how far we go beyond Ingress, so we talked about Ingress only doing like HTTP traffic. Um, we do HTTP, gRPC, TCP, UDP, and TLS. Um, we also have non-route types, which you saw like Gateway Class and Gateway. I'll talk a little bit more about those. And Reference Grant, which is kind of a special one. I'll talk a little bit about that one. So to just give a starting point, when you start with Gateway API, you tend to create a Gateway class. This effectively is just a resource, like Ingress class, that lets the resources that belong to it kind of understand what controller is responsible for provisioning those resources and hand handling their life cycle. So in this case, the Acme controller would be responsible for any gateways uh, that are associated with it. So we have a gateway. This is a very simple gateway that just listens on port 80 for HTTP traffic. And you can see from the red ACME, it's associated with the gateway class we showed on the previous slide. So it's attached to that. 
and then you can attach routes. And the most common route right now, the one that's heading for GA, and the most mature one is HTTP route, which is the parallel to ingress. Um, it gives you the ability, you have another attachment here, parent refs allow you to attach to gateways. Unlike the gateway, you can actually, or sorry, the parent refs have multiple uh, parent refs that you can actually do for a route, so you can actually attach to multiple gateways. Um, and then it's pretty simple, and I think I put, yeah, a comparison, so like, on the right there is an HTTP route, and on the left there is an ingress that does relatively the same thing. Um, but the right side is way more extensible. We have a lot more fields available, and you can kind of find that if you dig in a little bit deeper. This doesn't go super deep. Um, and that's kind of how it looks. We have all these different routes can attach to gateways, um, all the different types, theoretically, if a gateway supports them. Uh, gateways can, the there can theoretically be multiple gateways, and you can attach different routes. They may have any combination. Some may only do UDP, for instance. Um, and then this is one of the non-route APIs, which uh, we won't go into too much depth on, but one of the problems we ran into in uh, gateway APIs, we wanted the ability to be able to have an HTTP route or any route, uh, be able to reach like a service in another namespace. And so that's a boundary with some you know, security uh, concerns there. So we came up with reference grant, which is basically a two-way handshake where the actual namespace, you see on the left, the HTTP route wants to go to that service in that backend namespace from the store namespace. It needs a reference grant. Somebody with our back permissions in that other namespace needs to say, yeah, that's fine, and uh, allow it back to the controller to say, okay, and then it starts forwarding the traffic to that. That is a very cursory overview of these APIs. Um, but I have a link in a minute here that can kind of get you to the next steps uh, because Gateway API is very big. So, um, so that covered, we covered service, which is kind of like where a lot of people start with just getting traffic into their uh, applications. Ingress, which is kind of the stable existing thing for HTTP traffic, and then Gateway, which covers the gamut of everything else. Um, we are working on service mesh. This is kind of a newer thing that's happened like within the last year with what's called the Gamma Project. So that is actually right now nestled under Gateway API, so it's a sub-project of that sub-project. Gamma stands for Gateway API for Mesh Management and Administration. Um, so you can use it basically like HTTP routes, in, the, in theory, in the future gRPC routes and all that, for east-west traffic instead of just north-south traffic. Um, and there's six-plus implementations. These were the ones that I was able to like, get a hold of. That, uh, that do it, and there's conformance tests. We just, I merged it like days ago. So there's conformance tests that are actually in there now, which these implementations are starting to try to get working and like set up. So it's starting to gather a lot of steam. So if you're interested in service mesh, the Gamma project is a good place to hone in on. Um, because Gateway API is so vast, and there were, I think, eight plus talks at this, at this conference alone about it, um, you, I, I only scratched the surface. Please do go to our website, check it out. Um, we're also at that channel, SIG Network Gateway API in the Kubernetes Slack, and then uh, that's our repository if you just wanna go straight to the repo. Yeah. Network policies is another subgroup within SIG Network. Can we have a show of hands if you've used network policies before? That makes my job way easier then. It's a core v1 stable in-tree API that we have had for over five years now. So it was designed with um, tenant owners or namespace owners in mind. So for the app developers, if you want to secure your workloads and define rules on how you want to enforce your layer three or layer four traffic to flow, you know, between your pods, between your namespaces. And one such use case, for example, is what you see here. You want to be able to say, I want my backend pods to receive traffic only from my front end pods, right? That's a simple use case. And you can enforce that using network policies. And that's how a sample YAML would look like. You can use, well, namespace policies are, na well, network policies are namespace scoped. So if you define something, uh, define a policy within a namespace, it's usually, if you don't mention uh, selectors in the subject of the namespace, uh, network policy, like using pod selectors, it will select all the pods within that namespace, right? But you can use pod selectors on the spec to 
select a subset of pods within a namespace. And peers is what you define to construct your relationship on who you should talk to uh, or who you don't want to talk to. And this, the rules are of two types, ingress rules or egress rules, depending on what traffic flow you want to control. So you can have peers that are either other namespace, uh, either name, other namespaces or pods within the same namespace, right? So that's what, you, uh, that, that, that's what a sample YAML would look like and kind is ingress or egress. Note that the ingress and egress are explicit and they complement each other. So basically when you create network policy, right? Everything works until you create the policy. But as soon as you create the policy, everything stops working. So there's this default deny that you create. And on top of that, you have these allow rules that you create. If you are creating only an ingress policy, egress is allowed by default, so, and vice versa. So that's something to take care of. The API design is a bit implicit in nature because you don't really expect that default deny to be set in place because you just basically said what you want to allow, right? You never said deny everything else, but that's what you get um, as a gift with the allow. And I think I will recover the implicit part of it. And let's talk a bit about the peers in the network policy API group. So you can have, you can express peers as pods namespaces that covers the east west traffic scenarios but if you want to let's say also talk uh, restrict traffic to northbound so egress outside the cluster from your pods you can also use something called an ip block on your api in this in the spec part you can define it and that helps you define the set of ciders that you want to restrict or allow traffic to from and you might think, well, all this is there for the developers, but what can administrators in a cluster do to enforce more stricter rules that are non-overridable by the policies that are defined by the namespace owners? And that's why we have this new policy, the Admin Network Policy API in SIG Network, uh, in the Network Policy API Working Group. It's a relatively new one. It's been around for almost just a year. Uh, they kept merged a year ago, and we have the API repo that lives out of tree so it's still in the um, in the early phases of it. So we are a V1 Alpha 1 API, and we welcome contributions. So let's take a look at what that API entails, right? If you are an administrator of a cluster and you want to be able to express cluster scoped rules for regulating traffic, like let's say you want to say that the sensitive namespace in your cluster should not be able to receive traffic from any of the namespaces in your cluster. You can put rules that can express uh, such scenarios easily using an admin network policy. The API defines two kinds of CRDs. One is an admin network policy. The other one is a baseline admin network policy. And the structure kind of looks like that, the, the precedence, let's say. So if you have admin network policy defined in your cluster, those are the rules that get evaluated first, and they have a higher precedence. If there is no match found there, then you would fall down to the network policies. And if there's no match found there, then as an administrator, you still want to say, I want to have a default guardrail across my cluster that can help secure the workloads. And that's where a baseline admin network policy comes into play. And you can have at most just one baseline admin network policy. It's just like a default fallback that you want to put in place. The API design is explicit in nature. We tried to learn uh, from our network policy design, and then we have done hopefully better. We welcome feedback. So as you can see the sample YAML, how that looks like, we have a new field called priority, which is not there in the network policies that lets you, it's, it's powerful. It lets you set what precedence you want your rules to be in, in case you have overlapping subjects and peers that you're defining. And we also have the explicit deny action or an allow action that you can specify instead of it being an implicit deny. So you get what you ask for, right? There's no implicitness here, and it kind of mimics the traditional firewall that um, operators and administra administrators are used to. Like I said, it's in a V1 Alpha 1 uh, version of API. We support East-West only. We are in talks for having uh, support for northbound and to support more use cases there. Hopefully, in the next version of the API, we have that. And peers over here, in this case, is just pods and namespaces as of now. We are aiming for beta by the end of this year. Let's see. So uh, the current status is that we are having some implementations in progress. We're getting some feedback. And based on that, we're changing some parts of our API and seeing what's feasible and what's not. So if you are in the networking ecosystem, if you have use cases that you're, you, know, you want to secure your workloads across your cluster, you want to try out this, please reach out to us. 
uh, we are more than welcome to see if we can if we can accommodate your use cases, right? So feedback appreciated. And in addition to implementations, we're also looking into how we can have conformance testing, and we're trying to follow patterns that are similar to the Gateway API uh, working group so that we can have the CNI plugins implemented in a seamless way and then just report the results back to us such that uh, we can say whether you're conformant or not to the API. We have a subgroup within the SIGnet, which is called the SIG Network Policy API. That's the Slack channel on Kubernetes where you can find us. We also have um, bi-monthly meetings on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. European time. So please do join us if you're interested. We have a lot going on and uh, we would welcome all kinds of contributions. Moving on to the networking components, we have a proxy that is the default implementation of service proxying in Kubernetes. It's called kubeproxy. It's been around again for a really long time. And I think you heard what Shane spoke about services and endpoint slices. So what kubeproxy does is it converts these Kubernetes API objects into networking rules. And we have two backends that we support as of today. One is the IP tables backend, which is the default one. So IP table rules are created for every service and endpoint slice, right? And then the other one is the IPVS backend. And moving forward, we actually have a new cap there, um, which I've linked on the slide, which is going to support a new backend uh, based on NF tables. IP tables has been around for a really long time, and it has been the default packet processing uh, filtering system in Linux kernel. It's, I hear it's getting deprecated. We have Dan in the audience. If you have questions, please do reach out to him. But it has uh, some disadvantages, right? Like it does not really, um, there's absence of incremental updates, for example. It does not scale well uh, as the cluster sizes increase. If you have a large number of services, it takes a lot of time for the rules to sync. And we also, well, the, the larger issue over here is, of course, the deprecation. And we want to prepare for the move to its successor, NF tables, which is more performant efficient. And it solves some of these issues with IP tables. And also, all the new features are going into NF tables and not IP tables. So eventually, we do want to move to NF tables. So that's something that we have in store. And it's being discussed. And there's a cap out there. If you're interested, please do uh, reach out, comment on the cap. And I'll give it off to Antonio, who will talk about the new things that we have. So, OK. Uh, most of you will be wondering what these people is doing, right? So <laughs> uh, we try to adapt. We have different requests for new features. We have to deal with technical debt. We have to do a lot of things, right? As Surya said before, we have to fix your proxy. You have two caps there that are going on with QProxy. And this is mostly language support that is here. So if you have bugs or something, go to him at directory. Uh, but, okay? <laughs> but well, the state is well. You can track. We have a, a project. You are curious. You can go there. You can track. We try to keep it updated. And you can see what we are doing, right? We have these QProxy things. But we lately started to implement. And you can see with Gateway API. Gateway API says, GA there, right? But it's not a really GA. What we say is this group show a path to other projects to be able to to de de deliver quickly value, right? If everybody wants to merge the feature in, in Kubernetes core, it's very slow. You know, to are stuck to, I think, three years of discussions and some regressions. And what Gateway API demonstrated is that you can create a, work, create a working group, work with CRDs, and get things working and in a faster way than with Kubernetes. So we have all these working groups, network admin policies, another good example, right? And we have a working group now that is been working, I think, that for more than six months, that is multi-network, that a lot of people will be interested in that. We really don't know. They are targeting to implement in, in core, but re we really don't know. Right now, it's in a in inception incubation mode. Okay, we have an also another call caps that are going in alpha. So we realized that the we don't have a clear concept of or definition of the network in the cluster. Okay, and we need to, we want to provide a better experience for users. So the to be able to define their uh, or to expand their cluster network, the pod network or the separate network. So this multiple cluster cider, multiple service cider are two caps that are in alpha, but we are still discussing 
how can we provide the better user experience for all of you? We have another small feature that uh, allows to people to reserve the lower band of the node port. So imagine that you have a node port and you want it to be used for an application beforehand, right? And then if you choose a random value, it's another service in the in the cluster can get it. With this, similar to another feature that we did with cluster EP, you can reserve the lower value of the node port. So dynamic ports will never allocate it for that range. This is uh, a very useful, a small and useful feature for people. In, in addition, the other more important caps that we are doing is the topology our routing that I'm going to speak soon later. We had the expanded DNS configuration. This is a funny one. You know that with libc, you can, I don't remember exactly the number, uh, you can only configure the name servers. Well, this is since several years, you can have, uh, I think that until six or more name servers. So we had to wait two, three years to implement in the container runtime, to cascade to support all the Linux versions, and to finally people be able to use six name servers in the result.conf. That's an example of things take a lot of time to nobody people. So far, and I don't think, okay, and for graduation we had the to one feature that was very important for zero downtime deployment, that's the terminating in points feature. Then, what is the other one? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Ah, service traffic policy. This was a funny one. We have a lot of discussion because we have another feature that is topology aware routing and this collide. So basically what we decided is service traffic policy decide if the traffic is internal Oh, I don't know. It's internal and the traffic is local. It only is able to reach the pods or the points that are in the same node. Okay, so it's mimicking the external traffic policy for service, but for internal. To expand a bit more in one of these features, what I was trying to say before. Uh, right now, we don't have a clear definition of what are the networks in the... Well, we, we may have a definition, but we don't have a full agreement on what are the networks in a cluster, okay? If we simplify the networks to a pod network, a node network, and a service network, everything is configured beforehand, so your installer or whatever configure the flags. We try to come up with a better uh, design that allow people to modify and, and manipulate these networks and resize this network without having to, to recreate the cluster or trying to have, the goal will be to have zero disruption and be able to add service networks or add new pod networks so you can grow and resize your clusters independently of the network. The other feature that I mentioned before, and this took a long time to get implemented in, in QPros, I think that was implemented recently in 126 for beta, is the terminating endpoints. The, the key of this feature is that until now the endpoints had only a binary state, right? So the endpoint only know if the pod is ready or the pod, if the pod is unready, it wasn't present. With this feature that what we have is the life cycle of the pod in the endpoint slice. So the implementations are able to track if the if the pod is ready. If the pod is not ready but is terminating and is able to to share traffic, or if the pod is totally terminated. The way to use it and and the problem that it solves is to have zero downtime on rolling a day. So if you see the graph and you have a load balancer, the when you use external traffic policy local, the load balancer pulls the nodes to know in which node you have a, a pod. The moment that a pod is uh, roll, a deployment is rolled out, the pod starts terminating. That's important that your application handle this system signal so the, it can still process traffic. So during the period that the health check starts to fail, it is still going to serve traffic. 
before because we didn't have this this state in in the endpoint slice object the queue proxy automatically removed the pop so all the traffic was backholded with this the queue proxy know okay this is the only pod alive i know that it's terminating and it's able to handle traffic so let this pod keep serving traffic but the health check is a load balancer don't send me new traffic here right so this way when you roll out you have a zero downtime <laughs> it looks simple but it took a lot of, <laughs> of work to to get this working correctly so and the least the last thing that i, I want to talk is about topology and web routing and this is uh, a very demanded feature for several reasons, right? Uh, people that use cloud mainly want to keep this traffic in the same cloud, right? And it's just not most economic, but you know, you have performance and latency benefits. And you, some of you may have seen discussions on issues, and we always say, I'm trying to push back, but not push back for we don't want to do it. Pushing back because one thing is what you say. Or what you, another thing is what happened, you know? When we implement this, okay, you have a perfect symmetry and okay, everything goes to the place that it has to go. But when you are in reality, you don't have any control on the client, okay? So what happens when, I don't know, your scheduler sends 100 pods to, the, to one zone and those pods are the one reaching the service, okay? They are going to overload the service and maybe you have two other pods idle in, in another zone and you are not sending traffic. The thing is that we don't have a really reliable way to say, okay, this pod is overload, that overflow to another place. And this is one, or no, this is the main thing what we are trying to get this right. Because if we offer this tool to the people and people say, okay, I have preferred zone. And then, okay, I have preferred zone and you are giving me an outage and it's even worse that uh, paying for the interzone traffic. So what are you doing? You are doing everything wrong. So the other point is, and this is another observation that we have. The network is just not a workaround for the scheduling. Once you deploy something, you need to, ta to take a, a really good cool scheduling strategy. So with this feature, we just need to cover different layers. We need to cover the scheduling of, of the endpoints of the pod, and we need to cover how do we handle the traffic of the clients, you know? We need to do these two dimensions. And this is the thing that I personally am going to work during this cycle to see if we can get this right or to see if we can, I don't know, write some best practices or something so we can have uh, this feature and users can use it then without uh, black hole in traffic. And that's it. I don't know if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Okay. If you don't mind, because I just fixed that in Cilium two weeks ago. Okay, yeah. So this is a problem that we have in Cilium, right? It's what uh, I don't know. We talked before in the other talk. Is what is reference architecture? What is the re reference implementation? And how do we enforce behaviors? We have this program that is a conformance test, but this doesn't really fit our needs. And I know that uh, Shane touches on the Gateway API. What we are trying to do is we have this E2E test. So when somebody has a feature, it does an E2E test. And then that E2E test defines the behavior. But what we realize is that, that we are not promoting this well. I went to Sirion and I thought, why are not you you not running the E2E test? Oh, we are running the E2E test, the ones that say conformant. Okay, so right, that's the problem. We are not promoting that. The implementations of QProxy-like things need to run E2E uh, tests that may be not conformant, but are uh, QProxy-like -proxy conformance. 
it's, it's our fault in Sin Network to not make it clear to implementation. You know, we define the API, we define the behavior, pre run the test. Is it the responsibility of the CNI plugins to implement that behavior? We are trying to make it a little bit better where we can <coughs> implement more of the behavior in a, a core component that other proxy implementations can build on top of, um, but we don't know anything yet. Nobody? Yes. Uh, how about so, uh, gRPC route is moving really fast. We've got a lot of conformance going for that quickly, so that's actually tracking really good. Um, TCP and UDP route are ones that I'm personally working on. I kind of focus a little bit more on the layer four side of things, and they've had some trouble getting. We have people that are doing them, but like getting the conformance going and stuff has been difficult. Um, it's it's kind of a weird space. So we have a project in Gateway API right now called Bleaks, which is um, a, a reference and testing implementation of Gateway API that we are uh, kind of porting in to be like our CI testing tool, but also uh, it's a layer four implementation. So like TCP and UDP route specifically using eBPF for the data plane. And that's gonna help drive forward the conformance. So we should have conformance. I'm literally right now working on getting to the point where that conformance has started because conformance is at the core of how you uh, graduate or go anywhere in Gateway API. So they're in alpha today. Um, in theory, uh, we sh we're trying to get them into, when the GA happens and HTTP route and Gateway and Gateway class reach V1 at uh, hopefully Chicago, um, hopefully at the exact same time we have betas for TCP and UDP route. Uh, on TLS route, I'm not really sure yet. That one's kind of even in a weirder space. We do have some conformance tests and stuff like that, but we'll kind of have to see how that one goes and play it by ear a little bit. You want to add on that, Nick? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty simple APIs. And uh, it's possible, but I don't know, if we, don't know if we'll have the priority for it or not, but it is possible potentially that our reference implementation might be able to help push that one along too. But again, it's kind of, we're playing it by ear. We're waiting for people to jump on it. Any other questions? Go for it. Is that our last slide actually? I thought we had, okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I don't know, Robert, if you want to come. Okay, this is, uh, uh, come, come here, I, I can start. So this is the, the problem of, of Kubernetes. You know, you have different type of users. You know, if you give this feature to one power user, it's going to make it perfect. You know, he controls the network. But then we can throw this and we can create authorities. And we don't want this footprint, you know. And there are multiple 
problems, multiple solutions, and we are try going to try to get the best solution. But Rob, please, he, he was thinking much more than me on this. So. You can blame me for it. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, Antonio has been working with me on it. Uh, you know, topology is really hard to get right. Uh, I, we've gotten it wrong more than we've gotten it right, maybe. I don't know. Uh, what I'll say is we've been trying to take little baby steps towards something that's better. Uh, I think we all agree the feedback loop is the, the end destination that we want to get to. But that's just a massive project with the, you know, capabilities we have today. Uh, I don't know of a way to do that with IP tables, for example. Maybe there's other technologies that, but, you know, these are all huge projects in of, in of themselves. So the first thing we started was hints, like, okay, we'll, we'll just try and proportionally allocate endpoints. Uh, that felt a little too magic to a number of people. And so now we're starting to look at, well, we'll give you the dangerous thing. It will work for some cases, but have to like just plaster warning labels all over it. But it, it will unlock some real use cases, so we want to at least let that exist. But be aware that until we have a feedback loop, we're, you know, it, it's, it comes with some danger, as Antonio was saying. But I'll give it back to, yeah. Basically, we are going to implement pseudo on topology. You know? <laughs> What's that? Okay, I was just going to say, before everybody goes, please do check that out. So that's our readme. It has a ton of stuff in it. We'd love to have you join the SIG Network channel. And just a lot of people come into SIG Network like, wanting to get involved and stuff like that, but don't know where to start. We are happy to help guide you. Um, and the readme includes all of our different meetings for various groups. So find something that like you like or that it gets your attention. Join it. We have meetings all throughout every week. Thank you for coming.